Welcome to worship this week. We're glad you're here, even though through the magic of pre-recorded video, I'm not. Included in the email by which you received the link to our worship this morning is our worship order. I encourage you to open that and utilize that during the service today to access the words to our hymns, as well as parts of the liturgy that invite your participation. For all of the announcements about what's going on in the life of the church right now, from our children and youth ministry to adult Sunday school classes to upcoming meetings, please see the announcements and the calendar in that attached worship order. In the worship order today, as well as in the October Renewed newsletter that you received last week, are our guidelines for returning to live in-person worship. It is our plan to return to live worship beginning in two weeks on Sunday, October 25th, with a single service at 10 a.m. You will find information about that week in the worship order. Because we have to safely distance in the sanctuary, initially we are asking you to sign up to come to that service. There's a link in the digital worship order that you can click to sign up, or you can call the church office to sign up that way. Once we have a feel for how many folks are ready to return to live worship, we'll make adjustments to that. And of course, all of this is contingent on Franklin County remaining at level two. If coronavirus cases spike and Franklin County moves back up to level three, we will automatically return to online worship only. So do your part, wear your masks, wash your hands, and stay safely distanced when out and about, because we want to see all of you back here as soon as it is safely possible to do so. This is the final week in our series, New Places for New People. There's a story of a man who sets out to change the world, and he begins with grand plans, but as he assesses the task, he realizes that the first change that must occur is in his own life. How are we allowing God to do new things in our lives and in God's church? What will we do in response to God's call on our lives today? Today, as part of our worship, we will put our money where our mouths are, so to speak, when it comes to creating new places for new people. Later in worship, we will welcome new members, a lot of them, in fact, who are part of our 2020 new member class, the COVID class, we might call them. These are friends and neighbors who've come to us from different places and for different reasons, but who have found a new church home here in this place. I know you'll look forward to meeting them and welcoming them in person. So let's join together in the celebration of worship by singing together our opening song.
please join me in our unison morning prayer. We come into your presence, O Lord, with so many burdens and concerns on our hearts. Help us to be open to your words of healing and restoration. Bring us closer to you. Wash us in your grace. Enable us to discern your will for us that we may serve you more faithfully by serving others in need. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from John's Gospel, chapter five, verses one through nine. After this, there was a Jewish festival and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate in the north city wall is a pool with the Aramaic name Bethsaida. It had five covered porches and a crowd of people who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed sat there. A certain man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knowing that he had already been there a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I don't have anyone to put me in the water when it is stirred up. When I'm trying to get to it, someone else has gotten in ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was well and he picked up his mat and he walked. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Amen. And now let's listen to the children's message brought by Aaron Flory. working jigsaw puzzles. You know, jigsaw puzzles can be a lot of fun, can't they? You know, when we look inside this box, there's so many different pieces and they all have different colors, different shapes, different sizes. Some have straight edges for the border and some are all curved. You know, if you look at just one piece of this puzzle, you really can't tell what the overall puzzle picture is gonna look like, can you? Mm -mm. But when they're all joined together and become one, they show a really awesome picture. You know, this jigsaw puzzle makes me think about our church. You know, our church is made up of many individual members, but unlike a puzzle that comes in a box like this, we actually get to add new pieces to our puzzle. We're not just stuck with the ones that are here. Today we get to add 19 new members or new pieces to our puzzle of our church family. You know, when we're doing a puzzle, every single time we add a new piece, the picture starts to look a little bit different, doesn't it? You know, in the same way, when we add new pieces to our church family, our church is going to look a little bit different. Each one of these new members that join us today bring a lot of different talents and ideas and experiences that are going to make our church different in a good way. You know, some of these people, I bet, have taught Sunday school or helped with VBS at another church and might bring some really great ideas of fun things that we could try here. I know that some of them are really talented musicians and are going to bless us with their music. And I bet that some are going to have some really great ideas on how we can serve our community and show Jesus' love with our neighbors. You know, we're not going to be the same after these new pieces are added. Our church is going to be strengthened. And you know, the coolest part is that all of these new puzzle pieces are going to connect to the pieces in our puzzle that were already here. That's you guys. Yeah, and we're going to end up with a really awesome picture in the end that reminds us of how God works in such big ways when we come together as a church family. Let's say a prayer together. God, we give you thanks for each of these new members and for the way that each piece of our church family fits together in your plan. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our second scripture reading today is from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, chapter 3. I'm not saying that I have this altogether, that I have it made, but I am well on my way reaching out for Christ, who was so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I've got my eyes on the goal, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Would you join me in a moment of silent prayer? Lord, you journey with us throughout our days. During times when we feel confident in the direction of our lives, as well as times when we are buffeted by insecurities. Like Paul, we confess that we don't have it all together. So much in our world brings so much uncertainty right now. Even as we, in this time of pandemic, move forward inch by inch, step by step, towards resuming patterns and practices that resemble what might be called normal, we feel the tug of uncertainty. We feel the urge of caution knowing that our lives and our world right now feel as sturdy as a house of cards. Give us faith, Holy One, faith enough to know that you go with us in all these things. When we need help getting into whatever pool will bring us healing, come alongside us and carry us in. And when we encounter another who needs that help, let us be your hands and feet to carry our brothers and sisters into the warm healing love of your embrace. May the lives we live be in service to others and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, using the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I first knew I needed glasses when I was in first grade. 
I remember our teacher projecting film strips, if you're old enough to remember those, and she called on me to read or describe what was on the screen. And when she did, I would have to borrow glasses from my friend Craig Bennett so that I could read. My mom took me to the optometrist, Dr. Wilbur Ding, yes, that was his name, but the tests they used for little kids back then were so simple that even with my nearsightedness, I still passed. It wasn't until I was in fifth grade that I finally failed a vision exam and was prescribed glasses. I switched to contact lenses in high school and wore those until sometime in the early 90s when after injuring my right eye on a youth group trip I was leading, I went back to wearing glasses and have worn them ever since. For a long time, my prescription changed pretty significantly every year or two, but as I've gotten older, the changes from one exam to the next are usually only slight. But even with prescription lenses, I still struggle to differentiate between the colors green and gray at times, as well as with distance perception when, for example, I'm playing golf. External vision correction can only go so far, I guess. A little over a year ago, Lynn and I were in Sedona, Arizona on vacation, and we went to a stargazing event hosted at the resort where we were staying. A local amateur astronomer brought a collection of binoculars and telescopes for the group to look through, and he provided us a visual tour of the night sky. We began by looking through a powerful set of binoculars mounted on a tripod in order to minimize vibration, and he showed us how much is visible that way. Then we worked our way up through increasingly larger and more powerful telescopes until finally each of us had the chance to sit atop a stepladder and look through the eyepiece of a 12-foot long telescope with an 18-inch mirror through which you could see star clusters, distant galaxies, binary stars, and all sorts of intergalactic sights. In fact, I think it would have been powerful enough to read the license plate on one of those Apollo mission moon buggies if, we, if he had aimed it in that direction. After we returned home, having gone on and on about how much I would love to have a nice telescope because I've always loved astronomy and all things outer space, and that I wanted to be able to share that experience with our grandkids, Lynn conceded that maybe that could be a birthday slash Christmas present. I started doing research for what would be a good but moderately priced telescope, and I sent the information to Lynn. After that, honestly, I forgot about it. When my birthday arrived in December, I came home to find a large box awaiting me in the living room. When I opened it and realized what it was, I was so excited, I am not ashamed to tell you that I cried. Since then, I go out to look at the moon, stars, and planets often and welcome opportunities to show anyone who wants to see. Now, while you can certainly find beautiful high-definition photographs online from Jupiter or Saturn from the Hubble telescope that are much larger, clearer, and more detailed than what I can see through my telescope, it's one thing to look at a photo of Saturn's rings or Jupiter's moons, but quite another to see it in real time with my own two eyes. Seeing truly is believing. Reverend Sarah Wank, a United Methodist elder in the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, wrote a wonderful article about seeing in reference to our scripture passage today from John chapter 5. In the passage, a man who is only described as sick has been coming to the pool at Bethsaida for 38 years in hope of being healed in the waters there, but that has never happened. In some translations of this story, included is a later editorial edition that clarifies that the belief at the time was that an angel would stir the waters of this pool, and that if a person could be the first person into the water after it was stirred, then, after it was stirred, then that person would be healed. This man has never managed to get into the water in a timely manner, and so has borne his burden for nearly four decades. In considering this passage, Reverend Wank shares about a trip to Israel that she made in which she went to Bethsaida and visited these very same pools. And she writes, As I stood in the old city that day, I marveled at Jesus' compassionate action to heal. But it took my breath away when I realized that Christ's most significant miracle here was simply to see. To put her realization into some context, she began her article talking about how her mother had struggled when Sarah was a child to raise her family and run her household after dealing with the effects of polio. Her mother wore large metal braces on her legs and walked with the use of crutches under her arms. 
And her daughter recalled how her mother would struggle to carry grocery bags in her hands as she held tightly to the handles of the crutches, three young children in tow, as she labored to make her way through the grocery store to open doors and to do all the things that most people take for granted. Making the struggle all the more difficult was the able-bodied people who just pushed past her as though she wasn't there. Sarah then shared about her own young son, pretty small for his age, as he said quietly from the back seat of the car one day when she'd picked him up after school, that because he was so small, people just looked over the top of him, not even realizing that he was there. People don't see me, Mom, he lamented in what she describes as his sweet little voice. He saw that they didn't see him. Those small moments of invisibility to others caused this precious boy to question his place, his worth in the world. It's these two events in her life that came to mind as she, contemplating the miracle at the pool of Bethsaida, suggested that Christ's most significant miracle was simply to see. And she goes on to explain, the text says, when Jesus saw him. Jesus was most known for the miracle of healing, but Jesus' most vital ministry may have been the ministry of sight. Jesus saw the value and worth of those others overlooked. He saw the orphan, the slave, the sinner, the women, the outcast, the unclean. He saw them. And in seeing them, he was able to offer compassion in their pain ever before he stepped in to heal what was broken. Whether or not we wear eyeglasses of one kind or another, we all have vision problems. We all have blind spots to overcome. The question isn't whether we have them. The question is whether we're aware of them. In our passage from Philippians, in the verses we didn't read leading up to the three that we did, the Apostle Paul provides a description of his former self as the ultimate Jew, the perfect Pharisee with outstanding lineage and education and morality according to the law. And after describing how he had striven to be the very best in all things that he had done up to that point, he then goes on to say that he considers all of that dung. Actually, the Greek skubalon in many versions is translated as rubbish or garbage, but in reality, it translates most directly to feces. Paul is saying it's all crap. As Christian Eberhardt comments on this part of the epistle, Paul now rejects righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He hopes for one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. His new goal is the knowledge of Christ. Knowing the power of his resurrection would help him achieve his own resurrection, that is, his own transformation through Christ. Paul, you'll remember, was a persecutor of, persecutor of Jesus and of those who followed him. He didn't see who Jesus was, didn't recognize him as the Messiah, the Savior sent from God. It was only when he was literally struck blind on the road to Damascus that he could see Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. And only after his own vision was restored to him that he was able to see that his own salvation lay not in what he had done as the ultimate Jew or the perfect Pharisee, but in his transformation into a devoted follower, a disciple of Jesus. He first had to see, to see Jesus and then see the error of his own ways, his own flawed thinking, before he was then able to be transformed. And so in our reading for today, Paul writes, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong, by no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. Paul saw who he had been, who he was, how he was. He recognized his own blind spots, literally and figuratively. And because he did, he was able to be transformed into a disciple of Jesus Christ. And through Paul then, God multiplied the impact of the early church. And in the process, he was made new because a life centered on Christ is a life of transformation. In the United Methodist Church, we claim as our mission statement that we are to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And God knows the world needs some transformation right now. If we are serious about being disciples of Jesus Christ who change the world, if we're not just here playing church, 
then we too must be changed. We must be transformed. We must have our eyes opened, our vision restored, that we might see first how we are so that we might then see those in our world, in our society, in our community that others do not see. Because that is how the world will be transformed not from the top down by governments or institutions, by policies or programs, but from the bottom up by individuals like you and me who perhaps for the first time in our faith lives move past the idea that simply because we call ourselves Christian, we think our scubalon doesn't stink and begin to truly see those people who have been or are being overlooked, those on the margins because of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, or their socioeconomic status. It's only when we, like Christ at Bethsaida, actually see that whole segments of our society are not being treated with love and respect and compassion, and then act on it, that we can begin to think of ourselves as being Christ-like. God wants to do new things in the world through us, through the church. How willing are we to allow God to do a new thing in our lives, in God's church, and through us together in the world. As Sarah Wank writes, extending the ministry of sight to others the way Jesus did will require two things of us. First, to look in on ourselves through examination and confession, to acknowledge our blindness, and secondly, to identify our limited vision as we open our eyes to the needs of others. In order to see, we have to identify our short-sightedness. Only then can we correct it. And then, like a spiritual optometrist, she writes a prescription to help us correct our vision, the daily examine. The daily examine was developed over 400 years ago by St. Ignatius as a prayer practice in which believers reflect on the day's events and God's presence in them. This daily examination, which was also practiced regularly by John Wesley, asks us to unearth our embedded motives to look upon our sin and to identify bias and ignorance in ourselves with the intent being that by recognizing our own spiritual immaturity, our failure and imperfection, we can begin to grow in our spiritual maturity. It's only when we recognize the ugliness, the distrust, the bias, the fear, the pride, the sin that is buried within us that we can truly repent, turn our lives in a new direction and begin the process of personal transformation that will lead to the transformation of the world. It was those things that Paul came to recognize within himself. And rather than denying them, rather than blaming them on his upbringing, he embraced that that was who he had been in his past, but it would not be who he was going to be going into the future. Once we've seen the darkness that lies within us, once we have owned who and how we were before we became followers of Jesus, then we can begin to multiply the presence of God in the world by creating new places for new people. With internal examination, Reverend Wank writes, we're then able to shift our attention to a new external vision in the compassionate consideration of others. Compassion is a gift from God it's the ability to see what God sees, to care for the experiences of others as much as we care about ourselves. It is love for neighbor as we walk in another's shoes and give value to their story. The world seems to have lost sight of compassion. People seem to spend more time defending their own position instead of seeing and validating another's perspective. Compassion is necessary for seeing another person's story while simultaneously recognizing that we will never fully understand it. But first, it requires correcting our own vision so that in looking in on someone else's life, we might give value to their experience and recognize the obstacles in their way. It's when we follow the ancient traditions of the church, when we follow the way of Jesus by clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting the imprisoned, and caring for the sick, that we begin to experience perspectives that widen our worldview, that expand our vision, to see the struggle that people experience every day, but that we are often blind to when cloistered in our segregated neighborhoods and affluent communities. We can only be God's agents of transformation in the world when we open our eyes to the struggles that are all around us. 
As we consider how God is calling us to create new places for new people, we must first consider how God wants to multiply God's kingdom in and through us. Sarah Wank, in concluding her reflection on the passage from John, wrote these beautiful words. What those people didn't know as they blindly walked past my mother every day was the strength she carried as she raised her children, owned a business, and earned a graduate degree. How she mustered more effort in a single task than most people needed in a day. They didn't see the grace she extended as she forgave the hurt other people put on her with their ignorance. They missed witnessing the faith that fueled her to trust the Lord with every toilsome step. They missed the incredible beauty because they were too busy looking away. We will never know the strength, beauty, and grace represented by the people around us until we see them. Until we, like Ignatius and John Wesley, examine our hearts for our sin against them. Until we look in on their experiences with compassion. Until we see the truth of their stories and struggle. Until we recognize the value and potential right in front of our faces. Healing begins with sight. So the challenge God places before us is simply this. Will you commit to having your vision corrected, to seeing others, to really seeing others, that they might see the love of Christ multiplied in and through you? Amen. And now I invite you to prayerfully bring your gifts, tithes, and offerings to support the mission and ministry of Church of the Master. To support these missions and ministries of our church, you can mail a check to the church, or if it's easier and more convenient for you, go online and make your donation on our website. You will also find a donate button in the same email that brought you this worship recording. And as always, thank you. Today, we are pleased to welcome 19 friends into membership at Church of the Master. These are people who have come to us at different times and from different places, some who have been Methodist uh, for much, if not all of their lives, while others come to us from other faith traditions. All have traveled with us in community for some time and desire to be joined to this community, its rich history and tradition, and its people and ministries. So to the congregation, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitments to Christ's holy church. I present these who stand before us today who come to either reaffirm their faith at Church of the Master or who come to Church of the Master by transfer from other churches. I present Lynn Anderson. Lynn, as you know, is my wife. She is a retired nurse and she comes to us by transfer from Crossroads United Methodist Church. I present Wes and Bobby Orr. Wes and Bobby are both retired teachers, and Wes is a professional musician. The Oars have been longtime friends of Lynn's and mine, and come to us by transfer from Bexley United Methodist Church. I present Steve and Jean Perry. Steve and Jean live in Westerville. Jean is the daughter of Church of the Master member Marguerite Carroll and is a retired teacher. Steve is a retired college administrator, and they join us by transfer from Elm Park United Methodist Church in Oneonta, New York. I present Mike and Leah Kreiser. Mike and Leah come to us by reaffirmation of faith, having formerly been members of Reynoldsburg United Methodist Church. Mike is a project manager for Thrive Construction, and Leah, the oldest daughter of Lynn, uh, works in interior design. They are the parents of three children, Brady, William, and Elliot. I present Matt and Grace Whistle. Matt and Grace are active in our M&M's program as the parents of two young children, Simon and Cecilia. Matt is a science teacher at Westerville North High School and Grace is a social worker with Ohio Health Hospice. They come to us by reaffirmation of faith from the Columbus Mennonite Church. <laughs> Fred and Marcia Black. Fred and Marcia live here in Westerville and were members of Easton Community United Methodist until it closed. 
Fred is employed at Mills Metal Finishing and Marsha works with Huntington Bank. They come to us by transfer of membership from the Capital Area North District of the West Ohio Annual Conference. Steve and Pamela Black. Steve and Pam recently moved to Westerville from Florida. Steve and Fred Black are brothers. Steve and Pamela are both retired and join us by transfer of membership from Miami Lakes UMC in Miami Lakes, Florida. Christopher Bowling and David Day. Christopher and David come to us by transfer from Pea Ridge United Methodist in Huntington, West Virginia. Chris has been the director of music ministry here at Church of the Master since 2017, and he and his partner David, who works as a paralegal, live in the Easton area. Aaron and Kristen Shear. Aaron and Kristen began worshiping with us in January of this year and live here in Westerville. Aaron works for the Ohio EPA, and Chris is a registered nurse. They have three young children, Micah, Susie, and Jaden, and come to us by transfer from Maple Grove United Methodist Church. Since the earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. We invite these new members to reaffirm their baptism vows as they reaffirm their faith in joining this community. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, answer, I will. And now to you in the congregation gathered here or virtually, do you as Christ's body of the church reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With, With God's, God's help, we will, will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. The Apostles' Creed in threefold question and answer form appeared at least as early as the third century as a statement of faith used in baptisms and has widely been used in baptisms ever since. Candidates for membership along with the entire congregation join with the universal church across the ages in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith. So let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ our his only Son, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come up again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Matt and Grace Whistle are not currently members of the United Methodist Church, so in order to receive you into the United Methodist Church as a denomination, I ask you, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, answer, I will. I will. And now to all of you, I ask you, as members of Church of the Master United Methodist, Will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, answer, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in Church of the Master United Methodist, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Welcome to Church of the Master. And now let us all join together in singing our closing hymn. A blessed, beloved, and beautiful child of God. There are no exceptions, no asterisks, no loopholes. As we leave from this place today, may we continue to bear witness to the love of God in this world so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in all of us generous friends who truly see them as they are. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.